Hi there. I'm going to ramble about dot .files. I've already rambled like five times over, but I actually ran out of disk space when I was recording this. So this is a very off-the-cuff video, but pretty much the main point is I'm going to talk about my own dot .files. I'm going to try and instill some inspiration in you about how you might improve your own, or maybe just encourage you to take up a new, I wouldn't say hobby. Um, if they consider dot .files a hobby, I think you should go and seek help but um, a new appreciation for how much it can save you time, I suppose. So, of course, dot .files being the hidden files and folders that live in your home directory, they are the home of acres of crap that programs spit out as part of their runtime. It contains everything from binaries to configuration files, um, secrets, tokens, logs, everything. So, I've got a few links that I've prepared ahead of time, but that's really it. And I suppose it's worth mentioning, there have been attempts in the past to make a lot of sense out of all this. Um, there's a thing called the xdg base directory specification, which says here are some variables that you should honor. Your program should use these to store you know data files in the data home uh, location and so on for state and configuration um, which a lot of programs try to honor but by and large i'd say it's i wouldn't call it a failure by any means um, but it hasn't been a, a hugely overwhelming success either um, I had a quick look through Pinboard, which I've stored a bunch of stuff over the years. Um, and we'll talk about a, some of the origins of dot .files a bit more, I suppose. Um, my own dot .files, they live on the web. Well, they actually live in GitHub. I store them in GitHub. They're all uh, open source. You can read all of them. You can steal them, borrow from them. My own dot .files have borrowed from others, and I've tried to cite them here and there, but I suppose none of it's really, um, I don't know, what do they say, it's the highest form of appreciation, um, and it's, you know, everyone copies from everyone else, and I mean that in the best possible way. So I also have a website that I publish, uh, by which I mean some of the dot files are actually turned into readable files, and then um, Kind of put together from there. So the biggest one at the moment, and this is a work in progress, I've been pretty lazy, um, I've got a zishrc file and this has code blocks which actually make up my zish file. You could call it literate programming, um, there are definitely better tools for it like org mode which I used at some point, but I have my own little wonky tool that kind of rips these out and sticks them together and then the idea is you know I can write about why did I do this, or where did I get it from? And I, I got this share history thing from a Hacker News comment, apparently. Which I definitely would not have remembered if I didn't write that down. Um, am I encouraging you to no-life it and make a website that people can read? Not really. Um, starting small is always good. The main benefit I suppose I get is that it's easier to move on my configuration between computers, um, particularly a lot of my text editing configuration is the same between work and home. Um, and that's always nice to keep in sync. And as well, if I change employers or, I don't know, accidentally destroy a laptop, which has unfortunately happened at least once, then it's really easy to get straight back into things with, with not much friction. And it's also just a good um, uh, versioning strategy as well. There's plenty of things that I've removed and then I've gone back through Git history and I've brought them back or I've actually broken stuff and then I've been able to revert back to something working so it kind of removes a lot of stress as well. Uh, where did DOF files come from? Uh, there's a post that Rob Pike did on Google Plus uh, years ago 
almost 14 years now. Wait, no, I can't count. 12 years. <laughs> um, damn, quite a while ago. Um, he said that uh, Ken Thompson or Dennis Ritchie were using LS, which by default um, just lists uh, non-hidden files, but if you use the LA flag or the L flag, then it will, no, it's the A, uh, A flag, then it will show you hidden files and folders. I guess at the time, LS just showed everything, so um, I'm sure it'll be in here, but I obviously can't read and talk at the same time. Um, uh, they basically just put in a bit of code that said, if the first uh, character in a, in a name for ls is a dot, then carry on and list out the next file. The problem there being that it probably should have just checked for the special uh, dot and dot dot files. Uh, dot dot will take you up a directory, dot will just take you to the same directory. Um, but instead they just checked the first character and then they gave us a generation or two of hidden files because you could think about it or you could just stick a dot in front. And then out of that I guess came the uh, base configuration, um, uh, base directory specification and, and, and all that. Um, there are a bunch of tools. I use a tool called Chamois myself. Uh, manages both dot files and also non dot files. Um, I mean, it's aimed around your home directory, but you can put files in there uh, or folders that aren't dot folders. Uh, like, I have this renovate file in here, which shouldn't be there, but I haven't ignored it properly. Um, while I also have other dot files, like my zish file, which uh, Oh, you can see on the website there was those little um, hover things. Um, uh, yeah, uh, these are all copied from where Zish is storing them. There are plenty of other tools, um, and you don't have to go all the, all the way with Shamwa. You can use everything from some of these tools. You can use bare git even. Um, and apparently Atlassian has a bit of a tutorial on that. Um, if you're reading the Atlassian, what is this? They just have like a whole wiki or something. Yeah. Well, I don't know that I would get my uh, software development tips from people who made Jira, but okay. This is like a blog or something. <laughs> um, it's written in a very personal way. Um, Anyway, you can read that. I'll link it, I guess. Um, so one thing, or uh, yeah, main thing about Shamewire that's nice is it's installable on pretty much every platform you can imagine. It's a single binary written in Golang, so it's very portable. You don't need to worry about other libraries or interpreters or um, I guess the scripts, the shell that you're using and, and so on. Um, has Windows support. I wouldn't really do programming on Windows myself, but if that's something you would like. Uh, a very big one is that it doesn't require any bootstrapping. Now in practice, this isn't true for my own files because I've got a few dependencies. Um, you can use Shamewire's built-in thing to clone your files, uh, and I think that will install Git for you. Um, I, I always find that the initial install kind of falls over. That's not really a fault of shame why, it's just because I've got that much stuff baked into my own dot files at this point that they're kind of not... They're reproducible, I guess, once it's up and running. Um, I shouldn't use the word reproducible, that has connotations that I'm not willing to guarantee, but um, basically I just run them a bunch of times and then I work out all the kinks. And usually when I'm setting up a new machine, um, I end up improving my files anyway. Uh, but that's kind of besides the point. So support for private files. Um, uh, private in this case means 
like setting permissions for files. So if you're familiar with uh, SSH, um, as you may know, your uh, SSH key, your private key, uh, in this case ID ED225519, has uh, read-write permissions for uh, myself and then for uh, groups and everyone, I believe, uh, there are no permissions. And by default, when you create a file, very funny, um, it will come with, uh, what is this, 755644, uh, the 644, I think, which means that everyone can read it, but um, shame why gives you a bunch of tools to make sure that that's not the case, uh, particularly for your, well, you wouldn't put your SSH key in a, a dot file manager. That wouldn't be a good idea, but um, particularly for some other tools like GNU PG, for example, um, it'll complain if your GPG comp file is not set to a certain permission set, so you can enforce that. Um, there's a whole bunch of diffing and I guess file encryption. Password manager integration is a, is a really massive one that is basically a, a killer feature, I guess, for me. Um, and this lets me do the very difficult, otherwise, uh, task of I want to keep all my files open source so that people can use them and learn from them, uh, just as I've learned from other people's. But how do you also use those files on a bunch of machines and with programs that might need passwords or tokens and things? So Shema is able to call out to, in my case, one password, and it can get some uh, passwords at runtime. It'll stick them into the files and then it'll stick them in your home directory. Um, and basically what you end up committing is a template file that has a reference to a secret. So it could be a, a GUID, like a random bunch of characters and letters that work as an identifier, or it could be a path. I use pathing myself. Um, and then that just sort of, I mean, there's a bit of an art to it. Um, you don't want to put any paths that leak information like says, you know, my employee uses X or Y tool, but depending on the, the way you kind of work it, you can get away with quite a lot, I think. Um, of course, I'm not going to advocate for putting secrets or metadata in your dot files, but I take it as a personal challenge. <laughs> and, uh, and, and as well, I didn't really see anyone doing it, so it's kind of a... Um, a way to figure that out. Um, templates are also really good for machine-to-machine -machine stuff. So I have um, certain files that will do one thing on uh, macOS and another thing on Linux, which is why I shouldn't have used the word reproducible because they're not. Um, but there are certain things that will only ever exist on macOS that would never be valid on Linux and vice versa. And, or I may just want to switch it up based on a machine or use a different token per machine, things like that. Um, executable files, so these are like scripts and things that by default they're not runnable unless you set the uh, X permission. Variables, another big one that we'll talk about. Um, removal, so ShameWire keeps, a, keeps track of all the files that live in your home directory which means that you can actually undo them as well um, which is something that a lot of solutions don't let you do uh, then that means you have to keep track of like oh I moved in a zish file but I want to remove it so where is it or um, yeah things like that uh, scripts is another big one uh, run once scripts in particular so that'll be stuff like uh, I have all my homebrew stuff in a file and um, I want to install it all, but I obviously don't want to run that every time I make a change because it'll take forever. We'll talk about that and I'll, I'll show you how I manage mine. Um, and then some other stuff, which, yeah. So that's kind of an overview of Shamewire. Um, I'll give a... Mention to GNU Sto or 
GNU stuff. Uh, I'm just going to say GNU. It is a open source tool. Um, probably install it from your favorite pack package manager because it's just that popular. Uh, it will actually symlink files from a folder into your home directory. And I think I first learned about it from this Brandon and Virgo post. Um, apparently he has removed all the CSS from his site, which um, checks out for someone who does dot file management, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, so I won't go too much into it, but basically you, you have a have a folder somewhere, um, uh, probably a Git repository. Uh, in this case, it's a folder called dot files. And you stick all of your dot files that you care about in there. Uh, this could live in your home directory. In my case, it lives uh, somewhere else entirely or it did when I used this method. And you would change directories into the .files directory, and then you would say uh, stow bash. And running stow bash would then symlink bash rc into the home directory, uh, overriding, I suppose, what is already there. Or I think if a file already exists, they would probably complain that it can't make a symlink, but uh, that that is a whole can of worms that you have to deal with as well. Uh, also, keeping this in sync means if you run a new program, then it's going to stick stuff into your home directory, and then you kind of got to like sort through and find out what do I want, and then you got to copy it into this new folder, <laughs> delete the original because you need that namespace free, and then stow it again, which is not a huge deal, but it's just kind of a bit of toil, a bit, I suppose. Um, whereas the shame was set up. You can just make stuff in the source and then run apply. Um, you don't have to... No, that's not really true. You, you kind of do have to do the same thing. But... Um, yeah, Stoa is a great place to start um, if you don't care about all the bells and whistles. There's no real good secrets management. I think when I first started, I just copied files that had secrets. or I, Maybe I just put a placeholder string where I said password here and then I would fill it out manually. Um, but then you've kind of got to ignore the changes because they're going to get picked up. It's going to say, hey, you've had a file that had a placeholder and now there's an actual thing in there. Do you want to commit it? And you have to be like, no, please don't commit my secrets. Um, yeah, I, I did use this for quite a number of years. Um, I have my Zish file um, back before I had much of one. And you run stow Zish and then it would copy all this stuff apparently on a, on a Linux machine. Um, it's probably before I had my first job, actually. Um, and yeah, and then you um, source everything again and all that. Nowadays, I have this much wackier, uh, geez, almost 18 minutes, but this is rambling. This is what you're here for. I'm not getting paid for this. <laughs> um, Right, so, so we, we've kind of already talked about all the major selling points, um, so I'll kind of try and quickly go through this. We'll start with uh, editor config. Nothing special about it, I don't even use it. Um, I definitely have a lot of dead files in here that I should clean out. But I'm going to use shameyrcd. So it's just a shortcut to jump me to where shameyr is installed. Uh, why did I do that? I don't need to do that. I want to go to my home directory. Um, so I'm going to show the dot editor config file. Uh, there's a dot underscore prefix, which just means when you create this file, make it a dot file. And I think I mentioned, but the reason for that is you can also have files that are just plain files. Um, and you might want to copy these into your home directory. Um, I haven't really found a good use of this, um, but you could also use it for folders. Um, for example, I used to have a empty code folder, which is where I store all my code uh, as a habit. And then I would, uh, in Shame I would have a code, oh no, uh, 
Actually, here's an example. Um, so I have a, a library launch agent. A launch agent is like a, a daemon. It just runs stuff in the background. And it copies this um, plist thing in here. I also don't use it, but um, technically this is in the home directory, so it you know kind of figures out the diff. And as well, I could say uh, shame while remove library, and then it doesn't delete the library, it just copies, uh, just removes just this file because it has an idea of the state of um, what has been copied in here. So that can be useful for that. Um, that renovate file shouldn't be in there, by the way, I just haven't fixed it. Um, all right, uh, so there are directives like the dot underscore, which is useful for making stuff dot files, which is most of what we're doing. Um, there are also other directives I won't go too much into, but executable is one, which just means uh, for the script, make sure to set the execution uh, permission. Other ones uh, are private, which means set, uh, in this case, 600, so read only for myself, because that's what is needed, and, and others that you can read about. So, sure enough, it's very easy to copy plain files, but we also talked about templates. Git config is my uh, is a good example of, of one, um, and it's also a good example of um, variables and things too. So I'm going to go back to my shamewa directory. I'm already in one. Uh, I'm going to go there manually. Uh, the reason for that is you're supposed to do um, shamewa cd, and then you're supposed to exit by typing exit. I always forget, um, but if we check shell level, you can see I'm two shells deep. And then if I run it, um, I'll do it again. It's a ramble. You learn stuff. So um, the place that Shamewire stores stores all the uh, variables, or that you can configure them, is the Shamewire data file. Uh, there's no requirements, there's no schema or anything, you can just stick whatever. Uh, in my case, I stick my uh, name and email for reference. The only place I use this that I can think of um, is configuring Git. Uh, but I also have my work email, uh, which we'll look at shortly. Should this be public? Uh, well, I mean, most every company uses first or last name. I even wrote a post once about um, how to validate that these kind of things even exist, so, yep. Um, but this is, does make it easy, as I mentioned, if you want to change... Did I mention it in this recording? I've recorded this thing like five times now, so I can't quite remember. But um, if I change company, then just change this and it changes everywhere. I don't have to think which files use my email and stuff like that. Um, there's this other stuff, languages and libraries. If I don't run out of hard drive space for the recording, then I guess we'll talk about that. But just note that this is like a custom thing that I built it on, uh, bolted on to make Shamewire kind of double as a version manager for libraries, uh, uh, co libraries and uh, languages. It doesn't version manage libraries; it just installs the latest versions, but. Um, keeps all my global libraries and stuff in sync. So, yeah. Although I haven't wired this up again. I, I removed some of the logic while I was refactoring. I haven't put it back. But the languages do work. So we can talk about that. Um, getting back to... Oh, right. So uh, getting back to our dot .git config, these variables, you see here, name, name, email, email. There are some other useful variables like um, determining a platform, which I had discussed before. So for Darwin, which is macOS, Darwin's just another name for it, uh, then I want to use this particular program, but this program doesn't exist for Linux, so um, it also doesn't exist for Windows either. So only do it for Darwin. I also have a special work mode thing that I set. This is like a made up thing. This is not part of Shane Wire. It's something that I made up. 
um, but I set a variable in line by checking for a work mode environment variable. And I just check that it's set to the number one. Um, and if that's true, then I load in some stuff that is related to work, which is a work git config. There's not very much in there. I could put some special aliases and things as well. Um, but this just resolves to the value of uh, work.email. The reason for that is uh, if I do git config global, uh, if I get my configured email on my work machine, this will actually be set to my work email, which is important for making sure that commits are signed and things like that. Um, I also wrote about this one time. Uh, and I guess I will post about it. Um, yeah, I mean, there's not much involved, but if you know what this problem is, then yeah. Um, right, so templates are great for conditionals and things that might change in time and things that will change between machines. And uh, scripts, I guess, are the other big one. Um, oh, and I should mention that the structure, I mean, it's a lot to look at. Um, basically, there's a shameware ignore file that I have set up that says, you know, don't copy the docs folder or don't copy this assets folder, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, it does make a screenshots folder because I have a keep file, um, but I could also run a script to make that. Um, is this good UX? Probably not. I don't know that I would recommend it, but uh, as you use these things over time, and particularly with anything that's useful, it becomes messy, but it does work. And of course, just as you're the expert in your dot files, I am the expert in my dot files, and I know my way around at this point. So, um, yeah, but there are probably some tools that Shamar gives you to manage this better. Um, uh, there have been a bunch of upgrades uh, to Shamar that I haven't looked at, and I probably should, but uh, it works. So, uh, scripts, scripts, scripts. So there are two types of scripts, uh, three types actually, um, but they all have this run command, which means when Shema applies stuff, which I haven't even shown you, um, I run refresh, which is my special command, and this is going to run a git pull to get the latest changes. It's going to run an apply to um, apply basically copy all these files to all the places that they are named. Um, so it's going to copy it to the home directory and for stuff with the home dot directive, it's going to make it a dot file, stuff without the dot directive, so on. Um, it's going to execute the templates. Some of the templates call out to my password manager, as you just saw. Um, so it's going to do that through the CLI. Why did I take 30 minutes to show you this? Um, and you can see here that it's detected a change and that's because it tracks state. So this always changes uh, for reasons that I forget and that I haven't fixed yet, but also really hasn't been enough of a pain that I'm going to fix it. Um, I think there's like a shot in there or something that definitely could be ignored. You can just define that. Oh no, it's because it's a because uh, GNU PG is a folder, and uh, some of this stuff will be changing because it's, well, I guess the random seed is probably changing, that would make sense. Um, so you could set that to ignore other stuff, I think. But it basically asks you like, hey, there could be some other stuff that it doesn't know about that you might overwrite or whatever. Um, or is it because of, or it might be because it's referenced in one of these files and the outputs different. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so now that that's done, it's going to run some of these scripts. Well, it's going to run the run before scripts um, before it does anything. So it's going to check 
this one password running on Linux, for example, um, because this is a templated script, so it's going to check the operating system. Um, and then it's going to apply everything. It's going to run the script. It's going to apply everything, and then it's going to run the one run once scripts. So I have stuff like uh, uh, Homebrew. I'm trying to not show you the Markdown stuff just yet because it's my own custom hell. Um, in this case, it's going to install something called Atuin, which is like a shell history manager. Um, it's only going to run that once, so it's going to run on a first install, and it's going to run it if I change the script because it's hashing the script. Um, the important thing there is that the script itself is hashed. So in the case of, say, um, installing Linux packages, uh, this is not fleshed out by any means. This is me making a start. But um, if you were to define this list outside of the script and then import it, you know, read the file and then loop through it, uh, it wouldn't run when you change the contents of that external file because it's hashing the script itself. So. Generally, you'll see a lot of inlining of things in scripts. Um, that's fine. Um, I particularly do it with Homebrew. Um, just look past the Markdown stuff for now, but all of this is a big inline script that gets run. Um, normally, you'd have a brew file, but this is using this is using the directives that would go in the brew file, but it's doing them in line and it's installing casks and stuff. Um, and then it's going to run the run after scripts. So it's going to use RTX, which is a library manager, and it's going to install those libraries. There's also a lot of nutty stuff like setting doc items. <laughs> um, so let's say I remove my calendar. At this point, my dot files is just like a kind of a, a manage everything. And then you get to the point of like, why don't you use Nix or um, what's the other? The one, um, that other thing that they made <laughs> that I can't think of at the moment, uh, GUIX, is it called? Yeah. Um, but that's like a whole another level of complexity, and this works. This is like dumb enough that it works, and that's all that matters because I don't get paid to manage dot files. <laughs> uh, right, uh, so while I, ref I ran a refresh and it, it updated my doc even. And that's because the script is just uh, modifying macOS defaults. And you could do stuff on Windows, I guess, change the registry. I don't know why you would want to do that, but God help you, you could. Um, right, so we talked about scripts. We talked about ordering our scripts. Um, this is getting into non shamewire land, but for some of my bigger files, I like to store them as markdown files. This is like an unholy uh, literate programming type of thing. Um, there are definitely better tools for this. I know org mode, yep, Emacs has literate programming. I've used it. Uh, I had my dot files using it at some point. I mean, it's great. I like it. I aspire to like it. My problem is that every time I want to use Emacs, I find I have to compile it. And well, whatever machine I'm using, it takes ages, and I end up like fumbling around and wasting my time. Um, it's not a time waste. I have no self-control, so I can't stop myself from um, editing my config, and then I'm throwing my hands up, and I'm like, I gotta uninstall Emacs. Uh, now, if org mode was available as a nice standalone binary, my problems would be solved, but until then, I have this little um, program that I'm not even going to bother mentioning because you shouldn't use it. Um, and I haven't removed it or used something else. So, I mean, it, it works and it has worked for years. Basically, it just reads a markdown file. I'll show you the raw file. Uh, it will, it doesn't do anything with any of these, but it outputs the file to this. And this is a shamewire template because inside the markdown file, <laughs> this is why I don't recommend it because it's, it's actually kind of complex. 
inside the markdown file are schema directives like um, reading a password from my one password vault. The markdown thing has no idea what this is, but it will spit out uh, all of these bash blocks joined together into, into a template file, particularly this one, and then Shamla will render out the template file and fill in all the bits and pieces. Um, some of these comments, these are used by, well, because this is a markdown file, it's really easy to publish as a website. So I, I do do that, as you saw. Um, and these are like little directives that power um, the material uh, design markdown. Uh, MKDocs, uh, okay, there's an MKDocs theme called material. It doesn't matter, but um, it has these nice little things. So I, I get these little pop-ups and those are just like comments and uh, it works for me. And then I can, you know, I, I like to link coworkers and be like, oh, hey, do you want to, here's a quick script to calculate number of nines or how to look inside a JWT token or um, uh, why am I setting build flags again? Oh, because of crystal. And, and I honestly wouldn't remember any of this, but that's why I find the markdown thing useful. Uh, if you like Emacs, you should use that. Don't use whatever I made. Um, I'm starting to work on annotating some of my homebrew stuff because I'm going to forget why I even, you know, why do I have, uh, OpenSSL 1.1 specifically, or why do I have um, some of these? Yeah. So, um, oh no, I am getting lost. So, Shamwa is great, uh, helps you manage stuff, manage dot files. Uh, one thing I will talk about is uh, in my Zish file. And it's quite nice that this is the same that's on my computer because I can refer to my own configs uh, without having to actually be at a computer that I own. I could be in a library or whatever. I mean, I could go on GitHub as well, but it's nicer to read, I guess. So if work mode is set, um, work mode is just like a little variable that I, I put together. I think I mentioned it when I was talking about the Git stuff, but I don't remember because I've recorded this a bunch of times. Um, so we'll look at the raw markdown. Oh. Huh? Oh, wait, uh, close this, I, I don't need this anymore. Okay, so uh, uh, Shamewa Data, oh no, Shamewa Tomal. So this is another special um, template which, when you first set up Shamewa, um, you run an initialization and it will render out the contents of this file. Shamewa Data is designed for variables. Shamewa Tomal, you can also store variables, but it's designed. Um, Well, yeah, I mean, you could put all the stuff in Shamewa Tomal, I guess. I don't know why I haven't merged these. Um, so I have these little, like, feature flags. Uh, I used to have one if I was on Windows for Linux, which I don't use anymore. But, and I think a lot of it's resolved now, but it used to be the case that um, certain things were different. So I would, I would check if I was in a uh, Windows subsystem by uh, checking if the kernel... OS release contain the word Microsoft. Uh, in the work mode case, I check if I'm on a Darwin machine. Well, all my work machines are Darwin, or that they always have been. Um, and then I check if the output of uh, sys hardware model, hardware model, is a uh, is a MacBook Pro, which is what this is, uh, silicon something or other. Uh, well, I know what it is, but I shouldn't say it. Um, and that will do two things. It'll set uh, this language environment to work and we'll set work mode to true. Work mode is the most straightforward. There are actually not very many. Uh, I try to keep it to a minimum, but there are a couple of little um, 
snippets that I only execute at work, such as um, sourcing in these shared shell scripts, uh, any binaries that are work specific, um, which I actually don't have any, <laughs> uh, and I reference some stuff in the one password vault that we have. Um, now, of course, um, oh, well, you could use uh, GUIDs, which I, I did do for a while because I considered it to be more secret. Um, but then I thought about it and I was like, well, I'm going to forget what they actually refer to. Uh, I could look it up, of course, but it's easier to just do this. Um, now, this works assuming that this metadata is not uh, super private. And the fact that we use Datadog, I mean, you can go on our public GitHub and you can find out that we have an open source Datadog tool. So it's not much of a stretch to guess that we have a, a vendor relationship with them. Um, I should mention, by the way, this is all personal. Um, you know, uh, I kind of have to like talk about work stuff a little bit because it's my personal dot files which I share with work. But uh, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, but it the work mode thing is nice because it lets you balance um, keeping stuff secret. So. Um, you know, I, I could I can source in the contents of these, which may or may not have um, not secrets in terms of passwords, but um, information that shouldn't be public. And I guess that's why I feel comfortable talking about this because I've kind of gone out of my way to engineer some of this to make sure that there is no leakage. It's always possible, of course. You have to be pretty diligent, um, but yeah. The idea is you make it really easy to fall into the pit of success, by which I mean uh, you make it so that you, you almost have to explicitly leak stuff to accidentally be able to do it. You have to make it so that if you're going to make an accident, nothing can go wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, uh, the other thing is here in chainwide data. Oh, well, Shema Tomos hits this language environment thing. And then I have a script in. Uh, oh, do I have this anymore? Actually, I think I got rid of it because I use RTX now. Oh, no, I, I didn't actually. Right, so RTX is a version manager. Um, if you're familiar with ASDF, it's a Rust based. Uh, alternative, which is a lot quicker, but it kind of honors all the same um, plugin structures. Um, I highly recommend it. So I have my RTX config set up to read through this languages key, and then it will install. Um, what will it do? So it will get uh, get the language, and then it will use it if the value is a straight value. Um, in which case, not a map. This can be a string, as you can tell by the syntax highlighting, or it could be a, um, sem a semantic version number. Um, or, and again, this is not part of Shamewire, this is some wacky thing I set up. Uh, or, if it's a map, uh, then it will find, in Shamewire Tomo, it will find if, uh, its work or home, and then it will get the value and it will install uh, that version. So for example, I'm experimenting with Crystal, which my, uh, I haven't used in a long time, but the dot file thing that I made uses Crystal. Not that it matters because uh, it's a binary, so I just download the binary. But, um, you know, I install that at home, but I, I don't need that at work. So, uh, yeah. Likewise, I don't need the AWS CLI at home because I don't use it for any of my personal hosting, but and again, I uh, I find this useful to, to link to coworkers and be like, hey, I'm using this version of this tool, assuming RTX supports it. Um, again, I don't know. Is it really confidential that I use version 2.x of the AWS CLI? Not really. I started the repo. You can kind of infer that I probably use it for something or other. Um, 
Yep. It gets a bit wackier, I guess, with packages. I mean, the Datadog thing I already mentioned, that that's not too hard to put together. I don't even use this anyway. Um, most of the time, it's nothing particularly interesting. Or they're just global. Um, so yeah. Uh, as you can see, there's nothing that is installing um, these libraries because I, I did remove that, or I never ported it over uh, when I moved from RTX, but probably soon enough I'll write another uh, run once script and uh, have it do something very similar to this for the libraries key. Uh, you know, check is uh, cargo installed, and if so, then run cargo install. Uh, prefix uh, suffixed with a uh, global thing. It's probably what I need to change a little bit to uh, make it more explicit that go is go and um, yeah. yeah, anyway. So, I'm not really sure what else to say beyond that. It's been long enough. Um, Yeah, uh, I'll link everything in the description. Uh, hopefully this has given you some inspiration or I don't know. Maybe you've learned some stuff about some of the other tangents that I tend to go on. If so, well, that's a success, I suppose. But beyond that, uh, I don't really care if anyone watches this because every time I record this, I usually learn something new. So enjoy.